<coughs> Good evening, everyone. Here we see William Heath Robinson as he was in 1911. Um, he was born in Finsbury Park in May 1872, and his formal training as an artist began at uh, Islington School of Art, which prepared him for the entrance qualifications for the Royal Academy Schools, where he had the main part of his education as an artist. His first commission as a book illustrator was for a company called Sands and Company, and they boasted that they published the cheapest books in the world. <laughs> so he started on the bottom rung of the ladder, if you like. Um, they published Sunday School and School Prizes, uh, classics done up in fancy bindings on cheap paper and um, meant to go to children who'd done rather well at school. In 1902, Sands asked him to illustrate a new edition of Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare. And here you see the binding for it. Some of the drawings look a little bit clumsy or hurried, but um, in some of them his talent shines through. This is Ariel teasing Caliban from The Tempest. And uh, I think it's a rather fine drawing. Harmony of composition, strong characterization, and emerging sense of humour are all there. And for A Midsummer Night's Dream, he chose to show Bottom with his ass's head. And I think it's particularly original with its dumpy fairies and the tiny grateful Titania, contrasted with the lugubrious figure of Bottom. The book was reissued by another publisher about eight years later, and um, they chose to have the Midsummer Night's Dream drawing as their frontispiece and had it coloured but um, I'm pretty sure it was coloured by someone other than Heath Robinson. But it's still a very attractive piece of work. By 1900, he'd established himself as one of the leading illustrators of the day. And uh, here is an example of his wonderful set of black and white illustrations for the poems of Edgar Allan Poe, published by George Bell and Son, a much more upmarket publisher than... Uh, Sands had been. And here he's picked up on the Art Nouveau style. And I think it demonstrates very early on his versatility to switch from one style to another depending on the subject matter. Um, he was soon to uh, fall foul of Grant Richards, who'd published Uncle Lubin um, and wanted to give him a project that was worthy of his talents and chose Rabelais. But Rabelais was going to be a very large project, and he tried to get um, Grant Richards tried to get an American publisher to share the costs, but uh, failed. And by the time he, Grant Richards learnt that he wasn't going to get the money from the states, he'd already commissioned the p printers to start printing Rabelais, and so he was bankrupt. And Heath Robinson only got ten percent, along with the other creditors, of what he was owed. And so he had to turn to something that was going to give him immediate income, and that was humorous drawings for upmarket weekly magazines. And amongst the first subjects he chose um, was the Seven Ages of Man. Here we see the dame with her bonnet and patterned dress and the apron, and she occurs elsewhere in Heath Robinson's early work and also in his brother's Charles's work. The baby's feeding bottle, very um, unhygienic with its long sucking tube, but um, typical of the time, and is straight out of Uncle Lubin. And the whole scene is set in a misty East Anglian landscape. The twisted tree and the flower in the foreground are typical artefacts of the Art Nouveau style. The drawing is executed in a combination of pen and pencil. 
and the featherless bird in the tree was a recurring theme in his early work, almost a signature. And here's the schoolboy creeping reluctantly to school, um, mimicking the snail in front of him on the path. And here, the soldier seeking bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. Unfortunately, these are just photocopies of the uh, drawings from the original magazine. We don't, I don't have, and the museum doesn't have any of the original prints. In 1905, <coughs> Heinemann published Rip Van Winkle with 50 illustrations by Arthur Rackham. It was the first of a series of gift books that became eagerly anticipated as part of the publisher's autumn lists over the next 10 years. These books took advantage of the newly developed three and four colour processes, which allowed coloured illustrations to be reproduced photographically onto the printing plates. The paper on which the coloured illustrations were printed was heavily coated and therefore liable to crack if it was folded and so couldn't be sewn into the book. And uh, some publishers tried just tipping them in at the edge, but they tended to come loose, and that was very unsatisfactory. So what they did was to print them slightly smaller than the page size and then mount them on card or um, cardboard, um, which could then be sewn into the book. Hodder and Stoughton, the publishers, um, joined this trend with an edition of the Arabian Nights illustrated by Edmund Dulac. And this had 50 tipped in plates again. These books sold well and publishers were looking for both texts suited to the new gift book format and for artists who could illustrate them effectively. In the following year, Hodders started to issue a series of Shakespeare plays, each with 40 coloured plates. And the first of these were The Tempest, illustrated by Edmund Dulac, and Twelfth Night, illustrated by You Know Who. This was the first time Heath Robinson had been allowed to use full colour in a book. And uh, he said at the time he did not attempt to provide a literal record of the action, but rather to convey the atmosphere of the play. He approached his task perhaps rather like a composer writing incidental music for the play. The illustration here does not relate evenly to the text, but concentrate on those passages that appeal to him most, and in particular on the songs, which provided him with more than a quarter of the subjects. And here we see the clown singing the song, The Rain It Raineth Every Day. Although he was uh, free from a theatrical setting, he often in the drawings gives you an alternative viewpoint, which is typical of a theatre. And this is him using the aerial view, rather like being in the gods or the upper circle of an old-fashioned theatre. In this book, Heath Robinson was experimenting with the effects of light. It's seen filtering through trees or buildings to dapple the ground beneath, reflected from puddles and fountains, or diffused in early morning mist. And the tones vary from the warmth of a Turner sunset to the cold of a moonlit night. The watercolours from the book were exhibited in 1908 at the Bailey Galleries and the show was acclaimed a triumphant success. The Westminster Gazette said that Mr Robinson must be accepted henceforth as a watercolour painter of high rank with a very valuable and refreshing gift of originality and poetry. Uh, Mr Hodder Williams, uh, director of Hodder and Stoughton, personally wrote to Heath Robinson saying, I want to send you my very hearty congratulations upon the completion of your great work. I think the work is wonderful and I have every hope that it will be a great success. I'm going to ask you as a special favour to let me have one or two original sketches for my own specially done up copy of the edition deluxe. 
I want to keep a memento of the production of a work of which I am immensely proud and a permanent reminder of a business transaction which has been from the first the greatest possible pleasure. Looking back in 1938 in his autobiography, Heath Robinson said that the work was a joy to me from beginning to end. My drawings were designed to give a free illustration of the drama. I'm afraid that at times I've not resisted its many temptations to make a picture irrespective of its value as an illustration. But on the whole, I tried to preserve the atmosphere of the play as I felt it. The philosophic cloud appealed to me all through the work and I endeavoured to insinuate something of his philosophy into the drawings. This play, and the fact that the illustrations were to be in colour, gave me such opportunities as I had not enjoyed before. He had um, illustrated A Song of the English for Hodders, but then in 1912 he moved to Constable and Company as his publishers and started a series of gift books for them which I think represents the pinnacle of his achievements as an illustrator. A new edition of Hans Andersen's Fairy Tales was followed by Bill the Minder, a book that he had both written and illustrated and designed. It's a children's book and uh, he loved drawing children and used his own as models for Bill the Minder. And his next project, which he suggested to constables, was a new edition of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Looking back, Heath Robinson said that the old Greek stories of the wedding of Theseus and Hippolyta and of Pyramus and Thisbe and of life in ancient Athens as seen through English eyes, bewitched me. All of these, and their strangely harmonious combination with everything that was lovely, and humorous too, in our English countryside, filled me with enchantment. I was ambitious enough to try to express something of this in my drawings, and to make them a record of this, the most wonderful moonlit night in fantasy. He was now 41 years old and at the height of his powers as an illustrator and this book I think was to be his finest achievement. In it he consolidated all that he had learnt during the past 18 years. As with Twelfth Night, Heath Robinson set out to recreate the atmosphere of the play rather than to provide a pictorial record of the action. This time he had a subject that gave him greater scope for his imagination. It's the black and white illustrations that dominate the book and they fall into two main groups, the woodland scenes and the drawing of the rustics. This is a drawing by Aubrey Beardsley. And in the woodland scenes, Heath Robinson had developed a decorative style of drawing foliage, which was first used by Beardsley in a number of his drawings for the Savoy. Heath Robinson had started to refine the technique in the drawings for Poe's poems, seen here on the left of the screen. And his brother Charles had used similar treatment in one or two of the drawings for Shelley's A Sensitive Plant in 1911. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, the style is refined further and combined with the solid black skies, which makes them very dramatic. In these illustrations, the streams of fairy folk strung out like the tail of a comet and strong foreground patterns of wildflowers, vines, foliage or horse chestnut leaves produce a series of drawings that have great depth and variety of texture. They provide the ideal setting for that most wonderful moonlit night in fantasy. In sharp contrast, are the series of pictures of the rustic characters, the rude mechanicals as they're often called. Quince, snug, bottom, flute, snout and starveling. They're drawn with great economy of line and with little supporting detail in background or foreground. These compositions depend on the placing of the figures on an otherwise blank page 
in a style that is derivative of Japanese woodcuts. One first meets the characters seated on a long bench here that stretches the full width of the page, discussing the play that they're about to act out. In the foreground is a single beer mug, showing you that there is actually a floor there. And the walls of the room in Quince's house are indicated by shadows. The grouping of the characters is perfect, and each of them is a recognisable individual that one can then trace through the subsequent drawings. I think this drawing and its companions perfectly express the gentle rustic humour of Shakespeare's text. Two other drawings must be mentioned um, that don't fall into either of these groups. They're the beautiful illustrations of Titania on the seashore. This one illustrates the lines to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. And this one illustrates the line, full often hath she gossiped by thy side. Heath Robinson, writing of his first sight of the sea, said that he was thrilled by the sight of the distant horizon and the sun shining on a sail far away. This love of the sea and the seashore remained with him throughout his life and was the setting for some of his best illustrations, ranging from a drawing in Poe's poem Evening Star and eventually to these two in A Midsummer Night's Dream. There were 12 colour plates in the book, but they become rather incidental compared to the very strength of the black and white drawings. But they do help to create the atmosphere of the play, the sense of fantasy, mystery in it. The book was published in October 1914 and was described by a, by a reviewer in the Times Literary Supplement as the most complete and beautiful specimen before us of an illustrated book as a single work of art. Now, with the advent of World War I, um, the market for illustrated books almost totally collapsed, and uh, some of the artists of the day found themselves in dire straits with no income. But Heath Robinson did receive a commission from the newly established publishing house of Jonathan Cape. This was to provide over 400 drawings to illustrate a new edition of the complete works of Shakespeare. Work on the project had started in January 1921 and uh, Cape took a number of drawings to America in the hope of finding a publisher there with whom he could share the cost. By the end of 1921, the commission was not completed although 400 drawings originally contracted for had been delivered by his agent, A. E. Johnson. And Johnson reported that Cape and his partner, Howard, Ren Howard, were delighted with them. The following year, a further consignment of drawings was delivered, and at the beginning of March, Heath Robinson received £200 on account for the work to date. And here you see a tailpiece for Henry IV, Part Two which shows Mistress Quickly scolding Pistol. And if you can make out little hieroglyphics at the bottom, they say on another page the figure of um, Pistol is to be made into a separate block so that it can be used on its own. The precise format in which the uh, edition was planned to be published is not clear. But there are a few pointers to aid speculation. A letter from Howard requests that the pictures to run down the sides of the pages should be drawn in pairs with the same dimensions so that they could be reduced to a single block. Here we see two of those drawings, one of Sir John Falstaff on the right and the other possibly of Sir Andrew Gucheek on the left, again from Henry IV part two. Another request from <coughs> Cape for a drawing on every page in the set was rejected because it would have required upward of 3,000 drawings. And Heath Robinson's agent didn't want him to get tied down doing that lot and I'm sure Cape wouldn't have paid for them. But this implies that a set of 8 to 12 volumes, each containing several plays, 
was in mind, or perhaps a set of about 40 slim volumes with a single play or set of poems in each. The little remaining evidence seems in favour of several plays per volume. In a letter to Heath Robinson, Kate mentions that he would like a full-page illustration to face the opening of each play, a choice of words, I think, that implies more than one play per volume. This drawing from Henry the Fourth, Part Two shows Falstaff with Justice Shallow. The drawings for <coughs> Henry the Fourth and a number of the other plays draw heavily on Heath Robinson's earlier work. Here we see on the right the figure of Moldy, who clearly has strong relationship with Snout from the 1914 edition of A Midsummer Night's Dream. They've both got the same posture. And here the drawing of one of the potmen from Henry IV is closely related to a grotesque head from the 1904 edition of the works of Rabelais. He did like drawing people laughing. As these three drawings from Henry V and King John show, the history plays inspired a number of darker subjects. In, in illustrating Rabelais, he had an ample opportunity to explore the nightmarish visions and horror. But in his drawings for the history plays, he shows a capacity to depict pure evil. Here in The Two Assassins from Richard III, or the macabre in The Head on a Pike from Henry VI. Perhaps the greatest revelation is the highly simplified, decorative, lyrical style of drawing that he seems to have developed around the time of this project. Applied to a drawing of Cleopatra, it combines an almost abstract sense of pattern with a powerful dramatic impact that is ideally suited both to the subject and the format. In a similar style is this drawing of the assassination scene from Julius Caesar, with the soothsayer fleeing in the foreground. Whether the shift in style resulted from a conscious decision to make work look more modern, or a need to produce drawings more quickly? Or was it merely a response to the subject matter? We can't know, but it was probably a combination of all three. In addition to the figurative subjects, there are a number of decorative landscapes and pastoral drawings in the set. These two drawings of trees in summer and winter from As You Like It are masterpieces of their kind, capturing the tranquility of the forest of Arden in a few black and white lines and shapes. The illustrations made during 1921 were all in line, but in March 1922, a letter from Howard mentioned proofs that he'd made of some colour illustrations, and three of the finished coloured drawings survive. Here we see King Lear with his fool and Kent in the background, and he challenges the storm with the words blow winds and crack your cheeks, rage, blow. The Trust was fortunate enough to buy this because um, Harrop gave it to a charity auction to raise money for a, an author's retreat. The second coloured illustration is from Henry IV Part Two and shows Falstaff and Old Tear Sheet arguing with Mistress Quickly in the background. And this is shortly before Falstaff and his company go off to war. And the third coloured illustration shows a scene from The Tempest with Prospero and Miranda and Ariel behind the tree and Ferdinand in the background. And note the very stylized treatment of the tree and the figure of Ariel, rather like the Cleopatra drawing in black and white. Amongst the paintings that Heath Robinson left at the end of his life are a number of watercolour sketches, some of which might be of Shakespearean subjects. This one, possibly for As You Like It, is almost abstract in its elimination of shading and simplification of form, while capturing a complex and subtle range of tones to evoke a magical woodland atmosphere. I think this is one of the best of his watercolours. And here we see the same or a very similar subject treated in his more conventional impressionist style 
Once again, the handling of tone to evoke early morning mist in a woodland setting is masterly. And this much more formal watercolour is very close stylistically to the cape pictures, but it's not been possible to identify its subject. And it remained with Heath Robinson at the end of his life, so it wasn't given to cape. But this, this to me is pattern making at its most extreme with a realistic subject. Throughout his career, Shakespeare's plays, and especially the songs within them, provided a source of inspiration for some of Heath Robinson's most successful and most popular illustrations. Their drama and romance, comedy and tragedy, were well suited both to his personality and the range of styles he was able to deploy in their execution. This illustrates the song Every Elf and Fairy Sprite from A Midsummer Night's Dream. It was published in Holly Leaves Annual in 1944 and was the last of a series of uh, elf or goblin pictures that he made for Christmas numbers of upmarket magazines. To me, the figures are reminiscent of Richard Doyle's In Fairyland, or perhaps even more of Bruegel's Peasant Life. It's the last fantasy illustration that Heath Robinson made and was published a few weeks after his death. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.